Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here and talk to you about some of the services that we have in Brighton. This one is specifically a service to manage older people living with HIV. So obviously the first question is, why do we need a, an aging service for uh, people living with HIV? And I thought the best way to describe this is maybe by talking to you about a, a case, one of my patients. So this is the case of JJ. He's a 69-year-old man that has sex with men. He's been living with HIV for many years. And the main complaint to his HIV physician, who is me, was I'm fed up. I'm really fed up. I'm fed up with lots of things. And there is no surprise why he is fed up. He's got quite a lot of comorbidities and, and, and medical problems that he's had to deal with for many years. He's got chronic back pain, secondary to a very sort of severe degenerative spine disease and also some spinal injury from the past. He has these issues about peripheral neuropathy, um, mainly secondary to all ARTs. He's a, one of these long-term survivors. Um, had this diagnosis of presumed CIDP, which <coughs> similar symptoms that he was having with the peripheral neuropathy. Had diabetes, dyslipidemia, osteoporosis, and no surprise, he also has some mental health issues, depression doesn't smoke, doesn't really drink a lot of alcohol, doesn't do any drugs, Q risks not very that high. And you look at the number of medications that JJ is taking, it's quite a lot of them, and quite difficult medications that you look at elderly care, and medications that sometimes are not that great for some of the patients, particularly those medications uh, for pain. And as with many of our patients in Brighton and many of our patients in the UK, he's a stable on therapy. Darunavir, Ritonavir, and 3TC for many years. He has got a good CD4 count, and the viral load is less than 40 copies. So really, HIV is the least of his problems. So what are the clinical pathways for patients such as JJ with complex issues? So there are different ways that, at least within the UK, we tend to manage these patients. So one option is you give all these things to the GP. The GP primary care is normally very capable and able to deal with a lot of comorbidities particularly common comorbidities. We can refer these patients to hospital services individually. So if you got diabetes, you can go to the endocrinologist, the cardiologist, and so on. Or if you're lucky, you might have an HIV combined clinic with other medical specialties. In Brighton, we have quite a lot of them. So you can go to an HIV renal clinic, an HIV cardiology clinic, and so on. The problem, particularly with going to the general practitioners in some settings, and also hospital specialty services, is that there are quite a lot of barriers for patients. <laughs> and these barriers for patients are the fact that a patient that is already struggling with a lot of comorbidities and medications, and sometimes issues with mobility, have to deal with multiple appointments, and also have to attend services that are not familiar with the complexity of man managing people with HIV. We're talking about social issues, we're talking about mental health issues, and the mental health burden that our patients have. Also issues about substance abuse, not in the case of JJ, but issues about these funny medications that these patients with HIV have that we don't know what to do with them, which sometimes we get from some of these services. But also the fear of a stigma from our patients and healthcare associated stigma, the fact that they don't feel comfortable going to these places. And not only that, sometimes these specialty services are in different places, different towns even, where they have to actually commute and go. Like in Brighton, for example, the neuropsychology services in Hayward's Heath, and you have to take two buses to be able to get there. So some, some of our patients just not gonna go. What happens within the HIV service? So older people with HIV with complex biopsychosocial issues, such as JJ, normally are seen in our service once a year for a HIV annual health check, where they have all the sort of assessments that are recommended by the British HIV Association, so we're talking about a blood pressure, making sure that they have the DEXA scans and so on. And then they come and see the physician. And normally we have about 15 minutes consultations in a busy sort of service in one session. So it's 15 minutes twice a year to be able to deal with all that complexity. So really what most services do is we rely a lot on GP, specialty services, dealing with the nurses to be able to manage these patients and coordinate their care. That's really what the standard of care is in most uh, settings. So this is JJ again. And you know, he's got all these conditions. I have, we have given him appointments to go and see all these people. And he had to deal with all this himself. So it's not easy. We did a little bit of work in Brighton. Uh, one of our nurse consultants did some um, 
really good work looking at uh, people with HIV priorities. And I think they are my priorities too. We're talking about care coordination. That's what patients really care. We're talking about shared medical records and results. It might not be an issue in other countries, but in the UK, our patients tend to have a different hospital number if they are in an HIV clinic from the hospital. So that means that hospital specialties sometimes won't be able to see the notes of the HIV physicians and vice versa. Really big issue that we're trying now to kind of change. Communicating health information. I can spend half an hour just looking for a letter and sometimes I cannot find it. Our systems are not great. <laughs> a streamlined pathways for comorbid conditions to prevent this duplication of screening and tests. They go to the GP, they get a full blood count, they come to us, they get a full blood count, they go to the endocrinologist, they get a full blood count, you got three different results. A patient with the arms all bruised, angry, and we still don't find the results. So that's a problem. Managing appointments. How do you deal with all these appointments? I struggle myself to actually function. Um, so imagine if you have all these com comorbidities, remembering all these appointments. And also, they don't want health conditions to be treated with isolation. And that's a problem generally for older patients, regardless of whether they, they are uh, living with HIV or not, about multimorbidity. So it's complicated. It is complicated for patients, and it is complicated for um, doctors as well particularly us that we're managing these patients and we have only 15 minutes. So in Brighton, we decided to kind of have a response and, and that's the reason why we decided perhaps we need to do something a bit different. And we set up a clinical service for all the people living with HIV, particularly those with complex issues. So we're gonna spend a little bit time now just describing to you what the Silver Clinic is and does. So this is the team. We have an HIV physician, which is myself, uh, a geriatrician, now we have two of them, we have an HIV nurse that helps with the coordination of the clinic, and we have services from the HIV pharmacy, which as you imagine with our patients full of con medications, it's quite important to kind of have that support. Currently, the indications for referral, we tend to see patients that are over the age of 50, because traditionally we didn't really have a lot of older patients, so we cannot put that limit. However, sometimes we see patients that have a lot of comorbidities and they are under 50. So we tend to see those as well, but there are not many. The majority of our patients that we see in the clinic are over 50. They have multiple comorbidities, they have issues with polypharmacy and some other complex issues. And that could be some social problems, it could be frailty, could be false mobility issues and so on. So what do we do in the clinic? Well, really if we do, and it's mainly the geriatricians, and I'm just there to kind of contribute with this small part, which is the HIV, is doing a comprehensive geriatric review. And there are several principles, I'm not geriatricians, but they are excellent at looking at patients holistically in a completely different way. And they look at these sort of five things, and I'm gonna highlight this one because for me this is the most important one. And as any conversation with patients with multiporbidity should start, is what matters to patients, what really is, what is important to you. And from there, going to what patients have mobility issues, problems with cognition, problems with medications, and any other sort of multi-complexity. So it could be the multimorbidity, or it could be some psychological issues. But I cannot stress how important it is to ask patients what it matters to them. Because what it matters to you as a physician might not be the same, what it matters to patients, okay? And we look at HIV, we look at the HIV medications, we look at any other services that HIV can provide to help these patients. And we have objectives. We really have some objectives in our clinic. We try to kind of think about polypharmacy as one of these big issues, and geriatricians are very good at this. And it's about preventing medication-related problems, particularly drug and drug interactions. And almost one of our objectives, if someone like JJ come to us with 10 medications, our objective is they're gonna live with probably eight medications and feeling better. That's really one of the, of the, of the objectives. We want to optimize the management of comorbidities, having that sort of place where one person can somehow deal or coordinate all that management. We try to support uh, social and psychological issues as well, and trying to formulate some of these health interventions. So we might request more blood tests, more investigations, but at least there will be one place where we're gonna be dealing with this. Uh, we also work very closely with occupational therapy and other social services. If we consider that they are the issues that patients are having, and also, trying to kind of work with um, mental health providers to have this sort of pathway so we can refer these patients directly to them. And we started working with 
you know, other interventions such as exercise and also peer support groups because loneliness and social isolation is a big issue for our patients. So we need to think about that again, what it matters most to patients. And also it's about, it's, it's not about the viral load or the CD4 count anymore really. It's more about how can we improve quality of life with old age. We're not here to cure things. We're not here to, you know, get patients. This is not a clinic to cure aging. This is a clinic really to improve <laughs> quality of life. So yeah, don't refer patients to us thinking that they're gonna get the sort of cure for aging because it's not, it's not what a silver clinic is about. <laughs> so this is the process of the clinic. We have one clinic session a month. We see a maximum of four patients because you need time. You cannot do this in 15 minutes. That's the reality. So we tend to, s to spend at least 40 minutes, sometimes more with each patient. We discuss patients before we see them. We do certain assessments, we're gonna, we're gonna show you what we do, and then we have a plan of action, which really is an individualized um, care plan. So what do we do? We do a lot of pre-assessments, and I think the fa the, our um, HIV nurse is very good at doing this, tend to do it the day before they come to the clinic, or just before they have appointment on the day. We use quite a lot of patient-reported outcomes. Um, some of them you are familiar with, like the Euroqual, uh, we also use the older people quality of life brief, and we started using the HIV prom that was developed by uh, Richard and his team here at King's. Um, we look at frailty, we look, start to look at the physical activity now, mental health of course. We do a very comprehensive medication review. We provide patients with a medication passport, something that they can take with them to any healthcare provider, and at least they know that they are on certain medications and we know if there have, have been any changes. So something very simple, um, because sometimes our patients cannot cope with applications and phones and things like that. We have a pro forma, we, we collect, as you can tell, quite a lot of information, and we do some basic blood tests in, in, in some instances, which are requested by the geriatrician. So this is quite interesting, because we use this in our clinic, because we look at this, I'm trying to kind of see, because sometimes patients tell you one thing, but they write some other things. So this will give us an idea, a flavor of what is going on with patients, how are they coping with activities of daily living, what issues are with isolation and so on. Then we interview the patient. Sometimes we have carers with them, and we interview the carers as well, because sometimes patients tell you one thing and the carers are you know, telling you some other things. So I think it's important to have an overview of what is going on. We talk about HIV issues, you know, about the medications, how they are coping with them, and so on, pill burden, and, and, and so on. And also we do a comprehensive physical examination, which normally the geriatrician does. And specifically looking at issues of mobility and, uh, you know, and risk for falls, because it's quite an important thing in, in geriatrics. And finally, this is, this is the result of all this, is trying to have an individualized care plan for these patients. So, JJ again, he came to the uh, Silver Clinic, and we found that he was uh, still driving, and by the way, he said that it's the only way that he can get out of the house. He lives in a small village outside Brighton, and he said to me, don't even try to get, you know, to, to get me to stop driving because I, I just prefer to die. So that's what matters to him. We're not going to deal with that just yet. He lives alone again in a small village. He's very socially isolated, really kind of, it's a person that is very sociable, and unfortunately, because of social circumstances, he ended up in this small village where he doesn't really talk to anybody. He's clinically depressed, and, and his social benefits were reduced. Although, as you can tell, he's got quite a lot of poor mobility issues. So he used to have a carer going um, every day. Now he will have to pay for it. So that was removed from him, and he's not willing to actually pay for it because he doesn't have the money to do so. He had about three falls within the last six months, and he was really annoyed about some fecal incontinence that he was having. Obviously, he couldn't really get out of the house even if he wanted to. His HIV well control still. So, where is the Silver Clinic sitting into this standard of care? So we are here, and our idea is we come here and intervene, produce an individualized <laughs> care plan, that they, then we can share with the HIV clinicians, and then we can share with the specialist services and the GPs. So we are not here to replace HIV clinics. We're not here to replace what the GP does or to replace what the specialist service does. We're here to kind of help patients. And we tend to see patients once or twice, and that's it. And they can always come back if there are new issues. So let's talk about JJ again, about what we did. So what mattered most to him? Issues about incontinence. 
issues about pain and social isolation. That really was key for him. So we started treatment for constipation. He was referred to the gastroenterologist, and it was all about constipation, his uh, incontinence for some reason. But in a sense, he was all sorted, and now he's got a plan, and he seems to be happy with it. We started managing his uh, pain control, and then link with community services. And there are a lot of activities that our patients don't get access to, and they don't get access to because they feel that it's not the right place for them because they are living with HIV. But you would be surprised how many services are around you that you don't know about. And, and we managed to actually get them. And in Brighton, we're quite lucky. We have a lot of services for people living with HIV. One of them is called Positive Lunches. So patients go every Friday to have lunch and interact, and it's a social activity. So he started doing that, which is good, because he's very sociable. He likes to joke, and, and you know, so he, he finds it interesting, and he can drive to, to there. And also, we have something called a cafe club, and also started doing something with pets, that you can just share your pet and go for a walk. He cannot do that. but. Um, he wanted to because of the mobility. What about mobility? He's got poor mobility and falls. <laughs> he doesn't want to, work, to, to use a stick outside the, the house, but he's willing to kind of do it at home. So we got the occupational therapist to go to his house and do a comprehensive assessment and make sure that it's as safe as it is possible. Obviously, he's got a DEXA scan. The DEXA scan that he had was like several years ago, and he started his osteoporosis treatment. And, and now he's got a disability badge, which he's very happy about, because that means that he can park anywhere he wants. And, uh, and we talk about the mobility scooter. He's still thinking about that. Um, and then the issues about polypharmacy. So again, how we address this, so back to this, we optimize, trying to reduce one of the medications, so Darunavir and Ritonavir was switched to Risosta, and he tolerated that really well. We're still in discussions about the need for Sopiclone for sleep. Um, and I think we're getting there with him. What about the comorbidities? And again, the optimization of his management. We did that. We sent him to, to CBT therapy for his mental health. He was already on antidepressants. But we are convinced that if we change some of that social isolation, if we help with some of the other aspects that matter to him, then his depression is going to improve. Um, intent, there was no evidence of any cognitive impairment. We normally tend to ask the questions and do uh, a mocha. Um, to be able to assess that. And finally, um, it's about the quality of life. And <laughs> he was still fed up anyway. So it just tells you that sometimes it's not that easy to actually change people. So he was, I'm still fed up, but you know, we are convinced that probably he was a bit happier. So I just don't have a lot of time now. But I'm just going to show you a little bit about the evaluation that we did of the clinic. And you notice here, this is just a few patients between 2015 and 2018 since I've been in, in Brighton. And you look at the type of referrals, and a lot of them are because of comorbidities and polypharmacy. And you see, our patients are <coughs> four geriatricians. This is young, 67, OK? So a lot of our patients have these issues. And they've been, they've been living with HIV for many years. And again, the health burden and comorbidities are the ones that we are all familiar with, with HIV, cardiovascular disease, neurological, and so on. We're trying to look a little bit more about hospital admissions and what happened before and after. Oh, this is not showing here. But we saw a reduction in hospital days of admission. Very rough estimate. Don't get too excited. I'm not saving 4.1 billion <laughs> here. OK, this is just a <laughs> yeah, this is just really a, a just have a look and then see. So we are going to try to explore this in more detail. Interestingly, some of the prompts that we have, we didn't really see a change in terms of quality of life using this. It might be too early. It might not be the right tools to be able to assess this. We don't know. We didn't change it see a change in, in frailty. But patients and staff were very satisfied because they felt that they were a place where these patients had this sort of coordination of care, which is quite important for us because it gives you motivation to kind of carry on doing this. We're doing new things now. So we started with the smoking cessation, which is a big problem in people with HIV. Physical activity and well-being started doing that, working with some of our community partners, particularly the Sussex Week Beacon. And again, it's just about connecting to the community and how we're going to do that. And more lately, we want to do this. Can we go there and look for those patients that are pre-frail before actually they turn into frail? And that's what we are doing at the moment. So we started doing a pilot using a frail scale to be able to identify those patients. And those patients that are pre-frail or frail, 
they have the geriatric assessment, have this plan, and we can prevent them from coming to hospital in the first place for getting isolated. If they are just at that age. I just want to acknowledge all the people that work with, with us in the Orange Clinic, particularly Juliet Wright. I started this with Martin Fisher, Tom Levitt, who is now another, another geriatrician that is interested in frailty, and our nurse, Jonathan, that is amazing what he does, mm -hmm. and obviously all the other members of the community that help us with the Silver Clinic. Thank you. Thank you.